Welcome back, good people, to this episode of Flux Navigators. In the last episode, I was deep in conversation with Johnny and Daniel from Vespucci, and we were about to find out if they get into sweaty situations because of the kind of work that they do um, and what they do when they do. So let's find out. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the stories do take us to, 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 to dangerous places. And, and often, I'll say, Daniel and I, we sweat. But often we're fortunate to, to be in in the confines of our respective homes, um, and you know, really, the, it's the journalist who, who's who's putting himself at, at risk often for this. I mean, to case in point of one of the podcasts I mentioned earlier. In fact, a lot of our investigative podcasts, the journalists are going into quite uh, uncomfortable situations and um, have to, you know, be very savvy about their wherewithals and. Um, and yeah, and then on on you know the the back end side of it, Daniel and I are sure constantly with our, our lawyer looking over um, the um, you know uh, how to use certain materials and who might get pissed off eventually if this story comes out. So yeah, that that's certainly often a concern. Yeah, um, I, you know, stuff I you know, and and that's the beauty of your model because I think while on one hand it makes so much um, commercial and business sense. There's also a certain nobility, if I can use that term, um, to what you guys are doing. Because, you know, in my version, I mentioned earlier that I have my spiel uh, about Vespucci when I tell people about Vespucci, which I've done several times now. And I tell them, okay, just imagine, right? Imagine you're an investigative journalist. And I give the Indian example, and you're, you're making like 75,000 rupees a month, which is around $1,000. And uh, you're working your ass off. Um, going deep into a story for like two years, you've dedicated your entire life to it. And, you know, presumably you're thinking, okay, fine. You know, you're, you're not doing it for the money. Otherwise you'd be doing something else, but you're managing to bring um, the public's attention to something that, you know, they should really be knowing about that they don't. Um, and eventually, you know, you'll get a book deal perhaps if you're lucky. Uh, but you're not really getting fairly compensated in, you know, commensurate to the public benefit that you're creating. Um, and so I think, you know, purely from that angle, um, well, you know, just for what it's able to do for investigative journalists who often don't get adequately financially compensated, it's beautiful. I mean, and there should be, um, you know, I hope there are other Vespucci clones that come about and you started a whole movement because it's, it's something that should be supported. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, I, I would add that um, we like to think of ourselves as not only uh, an entity that can support financially um, journalists and journalism, uh, but also as, as creative allies um, and I mean, just to be able to brainstorm with a, uh, correspondent, a reporter, a writer, and think of different mediums, different ways to tell their story. And we found that now more than ever, uh, all of our journalists really are just really eager, open and excited for, uh, for the landscape to be opening up to them. I mean, Docs and doc series and the budgets are blowing up thanks to in part thanks to Netflix and the streamers and then obviously podcasting being a space now that they can explore their their investigations as well. So for us, it's not just the the, the gratification really of that collaboration is not is not just the the ability to to fund them and then to actually see some of these stories come to light, uh, which might have been censored either censored because of an editor or censored because they just didn't have the means to be able to tell the story they weren't able to tell the story uh but also just being being as um as creative uh as possible with the journalists and really trying to find the best way to tell the story and to to reach the the widest and broadest audience possible um and that's i think somewhere where we've we've we're, we're quite strong at and uh and I think that the, our collaborations and our journalists really, really appreciate that aspect of, of what we bring as well. And I can see why that's so globally resonant, right? And as uh, as a producer who um, who has spent the the majority, the vast majority of this pandemic 
in development uh, on a slate with my team. Um, all the stories that we have, I mean, we have a slate of, I'd say, a dozen odd projects, but honestly, um, nine out of 12 are in early stages of development and three are relatively um, pretty advanced, I would say. And all three of them um, have some factual connect or basis um, or inspiration. And and if I think about it, you know, there's something that appeals to me when I, I realized, and it was, it wasn't sort of, um, it wasn't by design, it just happened. And, and I realized that when I'm watching stuff as well as a, as audience, I gravitate towards stuff which had, which is anything that's based on a true story or inspired by a true story, just because at some level there is a visceral sort of thing that goes off in your head going, especially with stories which are not, you know, which are not well known and are being brought to the public consciousness by that format or that form that you're consuming at that point, which is to say, wow, this really happened. How did I not know about this? And I think there's something really powerful about that. So I, I totally yeah. agree with what you're saying. Yeah, that even comes down to, you know, if you put it on a very rudimentary level, um, some of the best stories that that you tell or that you hear on a familiar level, putting aside entertainment content and all that, but is is when you call up a friend or you see a friend and you say you're telling them about this sort of fascinating story that happened to you that day or or one that you know you, when you sit down with your friend you say you're never going to believe what what happened and you tell them the story and it's those that that are really are, are speak to us on such a, a deep level and, and when you watch sort of farther flung stories or grander stories on the screen or, or on audio or you read it um knowing that that there is that kernel of truth in there even if you fictionalize it but knowing that that there were real people that that this really happened to, I think it does speak to us in in a way that is innate in in who we are as humans. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, which actually brings us to an interesting topic, which is um, you know all the stuff in the past year. Um, have you, or in general, actually, does do you gravitate towards? the kind of content that you guys are originating at Vespucci, uh, not necessarily the stuff that you are originating, but the kind of content that you're originating, which is stuff that's based in fact in some way. Um, or what do you, Johnny, what, what do you um, end up watching? Um, we, we, definitely we definitely gravitate towards it. It, it. It's, you know, each of these, ultimately each of these stories have to speak to, to us in a way. And, and that, is is a differentiator that is hard to kind of um you know really really put a finger on often a lot of these stories are just gut instincts that daniel i our head of development our head of podcast will have and often we don't all agree on a story someone it might speak to someone in a way that it doesn't quite speak to everyone else but that's also uh good and healthy because we aren't also the the the, the audience often um, but but each of these stories for someone in the company really speaks to them. And and it's hard to really put a finger on what it is sometimes. It can be a character, it can be a theme, it can be a setting, it can be a world that we haven't seen before. And that's just something we want to dive into. And and yeah, I think Daniel and I, and Daniel, perhaps you can chime in here, but we we're obsessed with with true stories and 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 finding out about the real world in, in ways that we didn't no, it has existed before. Daniel, do you? Yeah, I mean, Johnny. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'll. Uh, I mean, if it's uh, if your question is also like, uh, are we like, what are we watching now separately from our company, and and mm -hmm. and how does that speak to our taste? Um, on one, well, I actually watched the Mauritanian last night, so I guess that speaks directly I to what it. we do. Um, and in fact, I actually then uh, there was like a uh, there was like a little sort of round table or virtual round table about the film with all the people involved making it. And uh, I was amused by how many times the actors, the producers, the filmmakers just uh, kept repeating the fact that the story is real. Mm -hmm. um, and being like the reason why the actors wanted to do it, the reason why the producers thought they had to be made and so on and so on. 
but I think on, yes, definitely. It's, you know, it's, as I said, we started the company uh, from thinking about, uh, about, about the business from a strategic standpoint, but also from like, you know, how, if we're going to have the power to start this and we can choose what we're going to do, then let's make sure that we're waking up every morning and working on stories that, that speak to us. So uh, fact-based was, was what it was. Um, but then also like, I, I don't know, I, I, I feel more and more the need to try and, and uh, after work, if you will, to try and now watch things that are completely different from, from the space that we're in. Um, so I did, I did attempt actually for the first time uh, ever to watch Lord of the Rings this weekend, which failed. I, uh, I got about 30 minutes in. I had never seen it before, but, uh, but is, I, I am trying. Is Lord of the Rings not a true story? <laughs> it is based on a true story. It is. It's loosely, it's loosely based. Loosely it's based. Loosely based. <laughs> Inspired by true events. It's uh, loosely based. Uh, but um, what did you think of the Mauritanian? I thought it was, I thought it was great. I was really, yeah, I was very impressed with it. I thought we, uh, I thought we were done making these types of films in a bad way. I thought that like, the, you know, the people were just not expecting these films anymore, but it was, it was very, no, it was incredibly compelling. And, uh, and, um, and he, Raheem is, uh, he's, he's an amazing actor and I, I was skeptical of what he was going to sound like in English, acting in English, but, uh, he was really engaging. No, it was, it was, it was strong. Yeah, I totally agree. It's funny because I watched it on, uh, I, I don't know, many people don't know this, but the Hollywood Reporter has this screening thing that they do that gives you, I don't know, for about four or five weeks in a row, I had access, like early access to all these movies which weren't available anywhere. I suppose it's because they couldn't go on screen. And so I had, and you have to go through this convoluted process of logging in through a screening app, and it's it's like you're a it's like being a member of the academy voting on something. Um, and so I was watching my wife and I watched the Mauritanian with my name written across the screen in little in small letters, <laughs> so which was a weird experience. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying about you know the need to distract um, and. I was having this conversation on an earlier episode with someone um, and we were talking about especially genre defying and genre bending stuff. Uh, I, I find, I don't know if, you know, I, I'm just, I'm very fascinated by, because my, I have a tendency to gravitate toward what's called prestige drama, I guess. And it's great because, you know, you have a, a long arc going across several seasons or maybe it's just one season, but you really sort of get deep into it and you think about it during the day. I find myself thinking about stuff in the day and like how I can't wait to, um, uh, you know, put the kids to bed and for my wife and me to get done with dinner and watch an episode or two, um, you know, and that sort of thing. But of late, I find that we, we've been experimenting with stuff which is, you know, with some stuff which is half hour um, uh, stuff like um, I May Destroy You or um, Atlanta. Atlanta was a while ago, but I May Destroy You or the other day or just yesterday, actually, uh, we watched two episodes of WandaVision as a family. So I don't know. Are you guys, do you find yourself, um, it, are you becoming aware of any new genres that you didn't typically consume? And what do you think about um, stuff which is, Hard to even classify. Have you guys watched I May Destroy You? I have not. Daniel, have you seen it? No. no. Yeah, and do you guys end up watching any half-hour uh, sort of stuff which you might find lighter? Have you seen WandaVision? I, I've not seen WandaVision yet, I, I, I confess. Yeah. Um, my, but, uh, but, my, Disney, my Disney Plus uh, sort of free trial expired last week, so. I'll, I'll give you my login, that. Daniel. Yeah. Um, what, what, what uh, it's interesting you mentioned format though because that is something that um has been consuming some some of our conversations um particularly with audio um the way in which um you know audio visual mediums are are slightly changing their formats um in terms of things don't have to obviously fit into an hour box or a, a 30 minute box um, and in fact, I, I, it's escaping me that there's a, there's a comedy series on, um, on Amazon that I was, I was enjoying 
and it was 20 minutes each episode. The pace of it was incredibly quick. And something Daniel and I have been uh, talking about, especially as we're, we're going to start um, creating our own you know, methods of distribution for our, our content, um, is that we don't have to play within the you know, 30 minute, uh, 45, 90 minute um, uh, sort of structures of, of audio telling. So for example, a podcast series, most of the time, and I'm not talking about an interview podcast series like this, but a narrative podcast series, um, most of the time there's sort of, you know, everyone tries to, you know, hit 30 minutes up to an hour, um, not, not much longer than that, not much shorter than 30 minutes. But that's something we want to experiment around with a lot is, is can we do 10 minute, five minute, two minute kind of shows that is still narrative based. So it's not your daily horoscope podcast but it's it is still narrative but told over maybe 20 30 40 episodes but in a much kind of shorter time frame so it's something we're experimenting with yeah and why not because i think um you know it just ties into a different consumption habit and it'll be really interesting to see what a two-minute podcast would be would be like i i would that would i would find that very appealing you know two minutes yeah two minutes is I'm trying to think what the what the sort of best consumption scenario for a two minute podcast would be, but I can totally imagine eight minute episodes, ten minute episodes. It's almost like you know the the mini TED talks, you know. So um, yeah, very conducive for a particular type of consumption for sure. Um, that brings us to a question that we've kind of covered a little bit of in terms of you know I like to ask uh, what do you so the question is what have you watched listened to and read in the past year that you absolutely have to share with our audience? Um, you know, choose, choose one or all three or, you know, go on, go wild. It's an overall question I'd like you to share uh, with the audience. Daniel, how about you? Um, uh, so, um, well, I, I read a book uh, called Hate Inc. Uh, by a journalist uh, he was at the Rolling Stone named uh, Matt Taibbi. And uh, it was, yes, I, 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 I highly recommend it. Um, so much so that we might, we might be working with him. Uh, but, uh, but the book is about, it's a look at sort of the, 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 the news industry and the, the media industry and how, uh, it, uh, it's basically a drug and addiction that we have, uh, and it's it's turning us into um, into individuals that are meant to hate each other, that are meant to despise each other. Um, and so, obviously, looking at several events over the course of the last thirty years, and watching sort of how media and news has evolved, especially since the advent of of uh, social media and uh, conservative. Uh, radio and uh, the 24 hours news cycle. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite an effective book. And, uh, and it's I, a super I compelling name. It really is. Yeah. Hate Inc. Wow. Um, so that, that's, that's uh, from, uh, yeah, from, that's that. And I, I actually believe he's coming out with a new edition uh, shortly, which will, uh, which will include uh, what happened during the, uh, the 2020 election. Wow. Um, and given you guys are leaning so deep into audio, is there a podcast or a particular episode um, or generally a show that you'd like to recommend? Well, th well, there was one that both Daniel and I have been enjoying, actually, which was recommended to us by Pete Sale, who's who's our head of podcasts. Um, well, f first of all, I, I'd recommend for people to, to check out The Messenger, which is on Audible. Um, which Pete produced and, and is fantastic. Um, but there's another one as well that Pete recommended, which was called Where is George Gibney? Which it was made by the BBC and, and made by this great Irish reporter um, who who ends up going to the States to, to track down this uh, swimming coach who was notorious in Ireland for his uh, sexual abuse. and uh, But he's still walking as a free man and was never tried to highly recommend where is george gibney it did give that gripping feeling that you mentioned earlier about yeah you know wanting to finish a task to then go back and listen to it and, and find out what happened so uh highly recommend that one 
Nice. And what's the messenger about? Daniel, do you want to explain? Uh, the messenger podcast is it's um, it's about a uh, a relationship that's formed between a a journalist uh, from the Guardian and a uh, someone who was involved in terrorism in the UK. Um, and uh, the sort of the addiction that that comes with the with with reporting, with investigating, with building a rapport, and the blurred lines between the personal and the professional um, in uh, in that relationship, and the the consequences of of that relationship. Um, right. it, yeah, got it. IRA? Uh, no, he's uh, it was it was uh, Al Qaeda. Oh wow. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, Shiv, Shiv Malik is the journalist. He's he's fantastic. Um, I, I highly recommend a listen. I will definitely check that out. Um, that's two things to check out right after this. What's the what's the sampling one called again? The site? Whosample.com. Whosample.com. <laughs> okay, got it. It's a great so wormhole. What's... It's a great way to discover music in a, yeah. in a kind of yeah, different portal. Okay. Can, can I ask you, Rupak? Absolutely. Um, What's what's the goal of this podcast, or what sort of inspired you to launch it? And who 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 are you hoping tunes in and listens? Oh well, thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, the idea of of launching this podcast was really based on my personal fascination with the way that the entertainment business has changed over the past, I would say, four or five years. And as I say in the intro to this podcast as well, I really think the the inflection point was uh, twenty sixteen when you know, Netflix said it was going live in 130 countries in one shot, which was totally unexpected. No one thought that was going to happen. But once it did, that started something which was really the globalization of <clears throat> of the streaming world, I'd say, right? And it was, um, uh, you know, this phenomenon that we talked about earlier, the decentralization of Hollywood. Hollywood has been uh, both a physical, it's been a geography as well as a concept. Um and and you know and which is funny because people expect that Bollywood is a geography as well. Bollywood is not a physical space. You know, people come to India and go to Bombay and go, oh, take me to Bollywood. I said so there is no place called Bollywood. It's not like Hollywood, <laughs> right? So it's um. But I think that um the so so far the the concept has been congruous with uh with the with the geography. But what's happened since 2016 over the past five years is that this concept of Hollywood has become all encompassing. And it's not, I would say, on one hand, global content is coming uh, to Hollywood and Hollywood is sort of now, uh, you know, has been dispersed and decentralized to be stories, content, everything that's coming out of everywhere. And as a result, it's resonating a lot more with audiences everywhere. And that particular phenomenon uh, is what has really fascinated me. And I think this is just the very beginning. What we're going to see uh, growing up, um, you know, growing up around the world, but still growing up on a largely American pop culture diet um, through my uh, childhood and teen years, I, I think it would have been completely unfathomable even five years ago that this kind of a change would occur. Uh, what we're going to see, I think, in 10 to 15 years from now, it will be almost, um, it will be completely antithetical to what we saw, you know, in the 80s, 90s, where there was a sort of global monoculture in a way. There is, in fact, the global monoculture will be a polyculture, um, which is what's interesting to me. And so this is, this podcast is really dedicated to uncovering the beginning of that, talking to people who are involved in that, either knowingly or unknowingly, uh, on the business side, on the creative side, mm -hmm. on the financing side. Um, and uh, in that process, I'm trying to reach out to an audience of people who want to either participate in this or are fascinated by this or are just sort of, um, you know, toying with the idea of of getting into it. So I don't know if that answers your question. It certainly does. It certainly does. Who, who way, of you, uh, if I might ask, who who in your looking at this is someone that stands out? Who's who's the dream guest that you would have on the podcast as someone who says, 
that you know they're defining what you're talking about in, is this great shift aside from maybe Reed had Reed Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I would say I there would be you know there's a few companies that I think are really fascinating in terms of the work that they're doing. Some are I mean if I had to talk about names that are sort of maybe more iconic and and more widely known either as companies or as um, uh, or because of the content that they're creating, I think Sister is a great example. Uh, just mm. the kind of stuff that they've done in the recent past, whether it's, you know, Chernobyl or Giri Haji or Gangs of London. The woman who runs Sister is Jane Featherston. Um, and so I'd love to talk to her about, you know, how they've gone about creating what they've created in a pretty short span of time, um, I would say. Um, and then, uh, so that's one example. I would say, uh, even though, um, Imagine is very much, you know, Hollywood establishment in in many ways. At the same time, they're a company which has really redefined content in, you know, their, their, their selection of stories is very specific and quite different from, I would say, um, the standard stuff that you see coming out of uh, or for the right from the beginning, from their inception, they've always been sort of they've got a unique take on stuff. Um, whether it's stuff that Ron Howard is directing or, um, you know, stuff that they're getting behind, which is coming from outside. So I'd love to have, I would love to have Brian Grazer on the show. Um, and uh, so those are two examples. Um, and then... Have you read his uh, book? I have. Curiosity. I have. I have. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the concept of uh, creative conversations was something really interesting and in how he would go out of his way to to set these meetings with with experts in fields that really had nothing to do with entertainment um and and then how he could basically trace a, a direct line between one one of those conversations and and eventually a, a film or um you know a 8 mile or apollo 13 or you know a film that he eventually ended up producing often started with a conversation that had nothing to do with with film and TV. It just just was about him being a, a curious mind. Absolutely, and, um, uh, that's uh, definitely something an approach that we've taken in, in various parts as well to go down wormholes and discoveries um, and, and just information gathering on on areas that we feel have have never really been explored before. I totally agree with you. Totally fascinating. And I think what did he say? He does uh, one a month. Was that it? He had a certain cadence to Something it. Like that. Yeah. But I totally agree yeah. with you. You know, that that reminds me that I was having this conversation with someone the other day. I've been in, I would say, media for um, 24 years in a way. But I spent much of it more in the advertising world than in the entertainment world. And now that I have been focusing over the past 12 to 18 months in on, on developing a slate of content to produce... I find myself pinching myself at times, not being able to believe that this is my job because as a producer, um, you know, you're not necessarily doing all the heavy lifting of researching a story that you're fascinated by. Uh, but especially given that, you know, we are um, particularly attracted to stuff that has some kind of a historical connect or a factual connect or something that is, um, you know, real world in a way, I find myself going down rabbit holes of reading all kinds of peripheral stuff and just generally increasing my knowledge about things which are, uh, you know, it's stuff that I would normally not do. And it's, it's, it's my job to do that, to just read and watch. And I guess it's pretty standard for people in the entertainment business, but I'm, forgive me for my, um, fascination with this idea because I'm kind of new to it. And I'm sure you guys um, are, uh, you know, even though you've been in the business for much longer, but, you know, you guys, especially given what you're doing, you probably end up finding yourself going down rabbit holes and being stuck in rabbit holes for some time, but then really enjoying the fact that you are. Well, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, we're spending 
less of our time, Johnny and I, doing that stuff, which is the best stuff, um, and now much more, you know, uh, figuring out how to sell a project or the admin side or legal side or how to maneuver some tricky situations that were brought up earlier, um, which is which is a real shame. But you know, the, when we first started the company, and I, I'm sure Johnny as well, we I look back at that time fondly where we we um, you know, we were just trying to just trying to convince journalists to work with us, and they had no reason to work with us, and it was just us calling random people who we we just really respected, uh, and trying to convince them to one get on the phone with us, and then two hear us out, and then three maybe maybe try and collaborate on one project, and just the process of like building that rapport with people who are, as I said before, also just so passionate about stories that they're willing to work a year, two years on something, three years, seven years. And then you can, if you can, if you can convince them, if you can, if you can really truly convince them that you are interested, that you want to hear more and you want to potentially try and help them and work with them to tell that story in a different way. Once they just kind of open up, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding moment uh, where you just get to, to tap into in a selfish way. You get to tap into someone's brain and someone's obsession on a specific topic and someone's interpretation of a specific topic. Uh, and that's something that, I really, you know, in a way, I wish we could still spend our time doing, and we just don't have the the, the luxury of time to do it as much. Uh, and we also now are fortunate to have a team of very trusted individuals and smart individuals who can do it for us. But it's um, that was, that's that's really one of the reasons why we started the company. I love that. Yeah. No, I hear you. Um, and I so given. I, <laughs> I know that there's going to be a time when, especially once we have, um, you know, a couple of projects greenlit over the next few months, I know that uh, I am going to be um, sucked into doing a lot of other things, which I already am, but um, I I ensure that as much as I can right now. So uh, today, for example, uh, I have spent six hours reading a book. I don't think I've done that um, in 15 years. Uh, so I, so I, I did that deliberately because it's a book I'm particularly fascinated by and I'm hoping to option. So I decided, is, yeah. is, is it called eat, pray, love? <laughs> because I, I have bad news for you. It has already been turned into a film. Oh, you might shit. not have looked it up before you started reading, but shit. But yeah. still, do but, for you, yourself, but, but, but you know what? You know what? Reading. But you know what? You know what, Rupak? Your instincts were right. It would make for a good film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's why I'm in this business. Thank you. Uh, uh, good. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll send you the Lord of the Rings ones once you're done. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, you might need more than six hours for those. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, send me the send me the source material, the the real, the true story. Yeah, that it's based on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, guys, this has been good. I want to ask you. Um, uh, so, this is a, a question that I've asked all two hundred and seventy five of my guests so far, um, which is, what if there was a billboard? If you had the opportunity to create or to put out a billboard for the world to see with your own message, what would what would that billboard say? Um, Johnny, let's start with you. Can I just for, for a moment just tell you about uh, one, of, one of the best billboards I, I saw, which is oh. I was in Hong Kong, and for years they had these, um, uh, you know, these billboards up that said, don't drink and drive, um, because Hong Kong had quite a, quite a problem with it. Um, uh, drink driving and, and so what Guinness put out with these ads when I was there that looked identical to the those billboards but they they just they flipped the words around and just said don't drive drink Guinness which I thought which I thought was one of the better sort of uh, and more entertaining billboards I'd That's seen brilliant. in a long time. That's um, the kind of stuff that inspires people to get into advertising. Yeah, and and then one other small one. It was I saw it in LA. It, it had it was a crazy billboard that was, it was actually pro animal testing, which sounds crazy, you know, but you don't think of that often. 
but someone had put some money together to, to, to kind of, you know, be advocates for animal testing. And it had an image on uh, the left was, was a, a rat, quite a, a mangly looking rat. And an image on the right was a uh, quite a young, innocent looking girl. And it was split down the middle. And, and the, the big line, sort of the big tagline on the billboard was, who would you rather? And yet the word rather was split in the middle. So on the left, it said rat and where the image was. And then on the other side was her and this little girl. And basically it's like, who would you rather be the one that get, you know, gets, um, you know, sick or, or ill or affected? Genius. Anyway, one of the more, genius. kind of one of the more genius ones. Um, in terms of what I would see, Daniel, what, what's your thoughts? I'll, I'll have a quick think. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. You were asked first. So you go ahead. <laughs> Daniel was like, Johnny, I'll have a quick thing. What are your thoughts? Well, while you guys um, think, I just want to say I um, owe a hat tip to Tim Ferriss for this question. It's completely unoriginal of me. And um, sure. I was trying to think of a standard question to end with, but I just took his until I do. And, you know, I'm liking it so much. I don't think I'm going to come up with my own question. I'm just going to keep hat tipping to Tim Ferriss. Yeah, I, I, I would, um, you know, I, I would. I'm trying to think of the exact verbiage, but but really, I would point people to um, to be more informed in 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 the sense of um, paying for, for for journalism. You don't have to pay for it, but I would say subscribe to to a paper, um, whether that's a local or a national one. Ideally, one of each, because I think that um, you know there has been this you know in, incredible demise of of great reporting um and and you know where we deal in entertainment um and and deal with journalists and work on stories that are for entertainment purposes um i also and we're fortunate that that you know there is this space in the market for us to be working uh, you know also conscious that it's at the cost of of a lot of people getting information um that that otherwise they'll find online and it's not sort of the, the tried and tested reporting that um whereas people before would go to newspapers um to find their information and and now it it, it it's less so so i i, I would i would encourage people to if i had a billboard to i haven't thought of the exact copy yet but it would be to 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 support local and, and national journalism good thank you for that daniel good I think it had something to do with like, maybe it's because I also have lived in America for too long, but I, I, something to do with like people feeling entitled, I feel that people feel very entitled and I would want to have like a very like sort of, uh, like a scary message, something that tells them that they shouldn't feel as entitled as they do towards everything. Something yeah. like that. Don't be entitled. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's good. I, you, yeah. you, you would enjoy this, if I may. Speaking of billboards and advertising, there's, I tell you, the company that I would use to do the billboard is a company called Colossal Media. I think that's the name, if I recall it correctly. Who they have all this advertising space across America, but they, they only paint their advertisements on. So they normally do it on walls. Oh, wow. um, they, they also do billboards, but it's mostly sort of brick walls and sides of buildings. Um, and they hire artists to hand paint all of their ads. And often if it's to do with a, a film or, you know, I remember them advertising in, in, in LA for This Is The End, the James Franco film. And he went out and with the artists painted the ad for the film. So, it, it, you know, and I remember people stopping by and taking photos and it was this very interactive experience during the, even the creation of the ad. Wow. So, Regardless, I would hire I would hire Colossal to do the ad because they're they're fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, nice one, excellent. Well, thank you guys. This has been absolutely amazing and a lot of fun. And uh, before you go, can you um, tell our audience where they can find you? Suppose someone wants to reach out to you and talk to you. Uh, how do they do that? Whether it's an investigative journalist out of Indonesia or someone sending you fan mail telling you they love you on the podcast, how do people reach you? 
Probably a fax would be the best way to get to us. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it's it's really our social media presence is uh, is interesting, but but probably on the weaker side. I would recommend uh, obviously checking out our website, which is vespucigroup.com, and uh, there's all the information to reach out to to any of our team, whether it's Johnny or I or uh, our head of development Bridey as well, who who uh, tends to receive a lot of our our, our projects and stories. Um, so I would say, I would say that's a very good place to start. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. This has been awesome. Thank, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. Absolute pleasure. And I will catch you guys soon off this podcast. Beautiful. Divine. Thanks, Rupak. Thanks.